Have you heard that the word becomes flesh? In this lesson, we will learn that to refuse to embrace the word is to live in outer darkness. Happy Sunday. Are you missing your Sunday school? Would you like to be a part of our Sunday school? Then like, subscribe, comment, ring the bell, and you'll be notified every time I post a new video on our Sunday school lesson. Congratulations to the two winners of our study Bible, and that was Shalom813 and Dorothy Watt. Please email me at AnnieOutNBChurch39750 at gmail.com so I can send you your study Bibles. And yes, we will do another drawing when we reach a thousand subscribers. Hi, I'm Regina Reed, and I teach Sunday school at Andy Out Missionary Baptist Church in Maven, Mississippi. Now, let's get into this lesson. Today's lesson is the word becomes flesh. This is coming from John, the first chapter, the first to the 14th verse. And our lesson aims today are one, explore the meaning of the word for the world. Find true inspiration for life in Jesus and live in relationship with creator God because of the light, grace, and truth that Jesus gives. Background scripture, 1 John, the first chapter, verses 1 through 14. And our key verse is John, the first chapter, verse 3. Let's start with a prayer. Heavenly Father, you demonstrated your love for us when you sent your son to live among us and be our light. Help us be attentive to the light of your son. Show us how we might reflect that light to our community. In Jesus name we pray. Amen. Introduction. We are looking for a new pastor and I pray we find a pastor who enjoys nearly every aspect of pastoring, such as visiting church members. During some visits, the pastor might enjoy drinking tea. I like tea with a longtime church member and asking about the person's walk with Christ. Other visits might be during, you know, less happy circumstances. The pastor might visit a church member at the hospital and pray for his or her healing. Most church members don't fully understand how much the pastor cares until he goes to see them. The in-person ministry to the individuals in our church will demonstrate the pastor's love for the members. The scripture tells us of God's love for his people. The extent of his love has been and still is being demonstrated for the world to see. Let's in context. The beginning of John's gospel is unlike that of the three other New Testament gospels. Matthew's gospel begins with the genealogy and the birth narrative of Jesus. This is Matthew, the first chapter, verses 1 through 24. Luke's gospel begins with two birth narratives. Luke, the first chapter, the second through the second chapter, the 21st verse, and Mark's gospel Skip straight to Jesus' adult ministry, which is Mark, the first chapter, verse 1 through 20. But the introduction to John's gospel is very different. The gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke are called synoptic, meaning the three gospels contain many of the same stories and sayings, often related in the same relative order, on that person and work of Jesus. John's gospel stands apart from the others as the writer stresses. Jesus' divine identity as the Son of God and Messiah, John the 20th verse, the 20th chapter, the 31st verse. The introduction to John's gospel draws the reader's attention to in referring to the endlessness of the word of God. Throughout this week's scripture, John makes references to the word. By using this designation, John is actively reflecting physiological and rhetorical concepts common in his day. Specifically, John's use of the underlying Greek word for word, which is logos, from which we get our English word logic, reflects the ways that philosophers tied to make sense of the world. Pagan philosophers use the term to address the ways of the pagan gods communicated with the cosmos and the created order. John flips the pagan expectations instead of distant animating life force as a uncertain connection to supernatural reason. John applies the concept to the word to the eternal, eternal God of Israel. This God is the one 
through whom all creation came into being. The good, this God has revealed himself specifically to his creation that John would repurpose an idea used by pagan philosophers. Makes sense, considering the condition and audience of John's gospel. The gospel was finally composed in the second half of the first century by Jesus' own disciple, John, the disciple whom Jesus loved. Lesson scriptures, 1 John verses 1 through 14. Verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Each of the four Gospels begins with a reference to some kind of beginning. You have to start at the start. The Word in the beginning, Genesis 1 and 1, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. This is a direct connection with the Old Testament. Having established the eternal nature of of the word, John proceeded to declare that the word was both with God and at the same time was God. Verse 2 The same was in the beginning with God. John simply restated the fact that the word was with God in the beginning. The truth deserves repeating. Verse 3 all things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. Also, it was through the word that all things were made. Jesus was an active agent in creation. Not a single thing that now exists was made apart from him. God the creator carried out his creative task by working through his son, the word of God. Verse 4. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. Life, or zo, is one of John's favorite words. Almost half of the 134 occurrences of the word in the New Testament are found in John's gospel. Zo most often refers to supernatural life that belongs to God, which the believer now shares through faith in Christ. Verse 5, And the light shineth in darkness, and darkness comprehended it not. The life that was in the sun is said to be the light of all people. This life light from the sun enables people to see that God is at work in the world. Life as the light of people makes revelation possible. It enables us to see God's purposeful acts in the world. The term life and light are frequently used together in the Old Testament. The light continues to shine in the darkness, but the darkness is unable to grasp its meaning it, or to put it out. Verse 6. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. This was the name the angel told John's father, Zechariah, that the child was to be given. The book of John describes John the Baptist as a man sent from God, thus describing him as a prophet. The Jewish crowds regarded John as a prophet, and that is also how Jesus described him, as a prophet from God. John's role was to bear witness to the light that came into the world through the word. Verse 7, the same came for witness to bear witness to the light that all men through him might believe. The Jewish crowds regarded John as a prophet. And that is also how Jesus described him as a prophet from God. John's role was to bear witness to the light that came into the world through the word. Verse 8. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of light. The purpose of John's witness was that through him, all might believe in Jesus as Messiah. Effective witnessing is telling others about Jesus Christ but leaving the results to God. John went on to note with detail that John the Baptist himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. Verse 9, that was the true light which lighteth every man that cometh unto the world. One likely reason why the writer said that John was not the light is because when he wrote his gospel, there were still people in Ephesus who were disciples of John the Baptist. Now the writer wanted them to know that it was Jesus who was the light, not John. This gospel repeatedly 
portrayed John the Baptist positively as a faithful witness to Christ. Every believer has a part to play in witnessing to the truth of Jesus Christ. But the Christ, but Christ is always the light in whom the church should point lost sinners. Verse 10. He was not the light, but was sent to bear witness of the light. Jesus brought light into the world. It was not welcomed by many of those who witnessed it. Verse 11. He came into his own and his own received him not. The aspect of Masonic expectation was the belief that the Messiah would be in the midst of the people, but would be unknown by them. Organized religion, along with the people who considered themselves the chosen ones of God, missed Jesus. They were expecting God to come another way. But the sovereign God comes as he will. It is every believer's duty to trust and obey. Verse 12. But as many as received him, to them gave the power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Accepting Jesus as the one sent from God, the one from above, who does and speaks what he has learned from his father, empowers those who accept him and thus become God's children. Verse 13, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. They are born from above of water and the spirit. The Holy Spirit as the advocate or counselor, the partialate will come to them and the father and the son will abide in them. These are God's children and their becoming God's children is not like natural human birth, but results from the salvation work of God. They were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of the man, but of God. A person must be born spiritually to be a child of God, but the birth of none, the birth is not of natural descent in the natural world. Pro, procreation was understood to take place through the making of blood of the father and the mother, hence the plural blood. But the children of God are not born this way. We are born of the spirit, as Jesus explains it to Nicodemus in chapter 3, verse 14. And the word was made flesh and dwell among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. God did not remain distant, remote, or isolated. Rather, in Jesus, God chose to live with humanity in the midst of human weakness, confusion, and pain. This bond holds for the contemporary Christian community as well. To become flesh, as Jesus did, is to know joy, pain suffering and loss. It is to love, to grieve, and to someday to die. The incarnation binds Jesus to the everydayness of the human experience. Conclusion. So much of the work of ministering and leading a church requires in-person work. Meeting church members for frequent pray, for, for fellowship, praying for them in the hospital, visiting families with newborns. These and other occurrences are commonplace in ministry and require physical presence. The central theme of the Christian faith requires a similar kind of physical embodied presence. God extended his love and grace to humanity in an extraordinary way. The word of God became flesh and dwelt within his creation. Now this act beyond human comprehension was an extraordinary gift of God's embodied presence. In response, People can accept his gift with humility, guidance, and faith. As a result of this gift, there is a change of identity to becoming the children of God. God's children are tasked with extending his love to others in an increasingly disembodied human experience demonstrated by the frequent use of smartphones and social media. God's children can intentionally choose to love others by their physical presence. How will you love others by your presence in the days to come? And I thought to remember, God's salvation has dwelt among us. If you have enjoyed this lesson, please, please subscribe. Leave comments, ask questions, give us a thumbs up. 
share this lesson. Let's protect each other, wear our masks, stay six feet apart because this corona is not gone. Let's love each other. And I will see you all next week.